Hello, everyone, and thanks for hanging out with us for the Behind the Numbers Weekly Listen, an e-marketer podcast made possible by Mountain. This is the Friday show that reviews the most shocking media news stories of the week. I'm your host, Marcus Johnson, in today's show. Takeaways from the 2022 Winter Olympics. I don't think we're going to see advertisers turn away from it en masse. I think you're going to see some who choose not to participate, but I think you're going to see a lot who jump into the void. What's going on with video length? But it sort of, you know, feels like almost a try before you buy feature in some cases. But what it does allow is the algorithms to learn and presumably make uh, recommendations that would get better to the individual they're recommending to. The decline of the impulse buy. Impulse purchases by definition are like fun, delightful, not high price points, but they're still like self-gifting. And now, especially right now with inflation and all these other headlines, and people are just worried about their purse strings. What's happening with delivery culture? An unpopular opinion about cart abandonment? And where did escalators come from? All right, folks, join me for this episode. We have three people. Let's meet them. We start with our principal analyst who heads up our retail and e-commerce business. It's Susie David Canyon. Hi, everyone. Hey, Susie. We're also joined by our principal analyst who heads up our marketing practice. It's Dave Franklin. Hey, Marcus. Hey, fella. And finally, we have our principal analyst who heads up our advertising and media practice. It's Paul Werner. Great to be here as always. And I have a spoiler alert. Oh, (laughs) well, sort of. I don't know where escalators come from, but I know where they're going. (laughs) Oh. They're going up or down, baby. Um, they're coming from Macy's. Macy's has the most authentic old school escalators in the world. The wooden ones, right? Yeah. Yeah. The originals. I remember those. Yep. Anyway, um, I, I digress. Thanks, I've Paul. already sidetracked the conversation before it even started. We've not even began the episode. <laughs> You're going to get in trouble. Yeah, he's already in trouble. Minus three points for Paul. Yes! But it was a funny joke. So plus three for no! Paul. He's back to zero. Come on. Anyway, today, <laughs> what do we have in store for you today? Four segments as per usual. The story of the week. Takeaways from the 2022 Winter Olympics. We then move to the game of the week. Where our contestants, Susie, Dave and Paul, will give us the main takeaways of each of the stories to try and win a pretend championship belt. We then move to uncommon knowledge. <laughs> we'll talk about some unpopular opinions. <laughs> Finally, dinner party data, random things we recently learned. We start with the story of the week. Takeaways from the 2022 Winter Olympics. The Winter Olympics end with smallest audience ever, writes Rick Porter of The Hollywood Reporter. The Olympics averaged 11.4 million viewers across all of NBCU's platforms in primetime. That's down 42% from the basically 20 million average for the 2018 Winter Games in Pyeongchang, South Korea. NBCU's coverage from Beijing is also down about 26% from the 2021 Summer Olympics in Tokyo, which averaged nearly 16 million primetime viewers. Folks, what were some of your main takeaways uh, from this year's Olympics? Paul, maybe we can start with you. You um, have a focus on TV and video for us. What jumped out to you about this past games? Well, I mean, it really just was pretty much down across the board. I mean, the streaming numbers were up a little bit, but that's more a function of streaming, just gaining ground over the past four years or the past two years, depending on what you're comparing it to. But I think when you look at the Olympics overall, and particularly the Winter Olympics, at this point, it's almost a damaged brand, or or this particular Mm. version was. I mean, you have so many things working against it. You have time zone difference. You have a lack of compelling storylines, at least for the U.S. audience. You know, poor performance by U.S. athletes. You have uh, (laughs) some geopolitical issues that preceded the games. And then you had a lot of anxiety over other geopolitical issues that started, you know, gaining ground as the games were on and really on and on. I mean, you know, you have the pandemic, so there's less excitement when people aren't in the arenas and when the, you know, announcers and commentators are off site. So just one thing after another, and it really amounts to something that I think NBC is going to have to, I don't know about rethink because they've contracted for this for many, many years, but maybe rethink how to approach it or how to inject some more excitement into it. So I was sad about the statement about the poor athletes. How much pressure is that on the athletes to bring in viewership? Yeah, I mean, it, it is a lot of pressure. And I think that one of the, maybe it's it's a good news, bad news about how a lot of athletes are prioritizing their own mental and, and physical health over performance, which I think is positive. But I think when it comes to people tuning in and wanting to see these great moments that they've seen in the past with, you know, Michael Phelps and so many other people 
and so many other teams. If that's lacking, then it's obviously going to affect viewership. So, yeah. yeah. There was an interesting note from Tiffany Sue of the New York Times. Uh, she'd cited Tang Tang, who's a media professor at Kent State University who studied the Olympics. They said, the Olympics brand is really struggling. A lot of people don't feel an emotional connection anymore. And saying that the Beijing Olympics uh, lacked the kind of powerhouse narrative, Paul, to what you were saying, that turned American swimmer Michael Phelps and his eight gold medals into must-watch TV in 2008. One of the breakout stars of this year's games, the Chinese-American skier Eileen Gu, competed for China rather than the US. The players in the NHL didn't participate. And Professor Tang was saying, audiences watch the Olympics for stories. They need that superhero story, that star quality. They don't really see the Olympics as a true sporting event, but rather as something more personal. Uh, Dave, where do you land on this? Yeah, I think I would agree with everything Paul said in terms of, I think, the confluence of sort of politics, COVID, was obviously cheating stories. You know, there's a whole bunch of different things going on as part of this. The other thing that we haven't mentioned, though, that I thought was interesting was just the lack of, I think, overshadowed by that geopolitics issue, uh, human rights issues, et cetera, is, is a lot of the, the huge sponsors. They spent billions of dollars to sponsor, and they didn't do a lot to monetize their sponsorship. I think a lot of those stories in the past, a lot of those famous athletes that we know are as a result of sponsors building up those stories in advance. And I think there was a lot of stories that came out before this Olympics about uh, sponsors that had already dropped a lot of money, not further monetizing it, not creating some of those stories. Yeah. <laughs> How much is it worth advertising at the Olympics anymore? Has it gotten to the point where advertisers are starting to hesitate before they advertise? Because in total, 160 million Americans watched NBC's Beijing Olympics presentation at some point in the two and a half odd weeks that it was on across NBC, Peacock, its streaming service and other digital platforms. That's from NBC and iSpot TV. So that's not chump change. I think it's still the most watched event outside of the Super Bowl. But the audience is falling. And Paul, to your point, the streaming audience for the Games was one of the largest for any Olympics to date. Streaming on Peacock, NBC, Olympics.com and the NBC Sports app had an average primetime viewership of over half a million viewers. That's up 8% from the summer. Streaming made up 5% of total primetime audiences. So with the viewership numbers taken into consideration and the Olympics as a brand taking somewhat of a hit, how do you think advertisers are going to feel about the Olympics moving forward? It's uh, 2024 Summer Olympics will be in Paris. That's the next one we've got lined up. How are they going to start to feel about this event? I think it's a little bit like the Super Bowl where you have certain advertisers drop out, including ones that have spent a lot of money in past years because, you know, they, there are cycles in their, their spending plans, but there's always someone else who will jump in. And I think with the Olympics, there's also always the possibility of an interesting story developing during the games and catching a lot of attention. So I think for that reason, and because despite the decline in numbers, it's still a big audience and, you know, the brand is damaged, but it still has cachet. So I think yep. for all those reasons, I don't think we're going to see advertisers turn away from it en masse. I think you're going to see some who choose not to participate, but I think you're going to see a lot who jump into the void. I also think the context is that all of these shows have less people watching, you know, the Oscars, all the award shows. So it's not just the Olympics, it's everything there. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, it's another way of spending your time and not everybody is choosing to do that in front of the TV anymore, even though you can do it at your own time. For me, I'm an avid supporter of the Olympics, especially the Winter Olympics, but I didn't get any sort of ping notifications like now is the opening ceremony, now is the closing. Like I had no mm. idea of what to watch when. And unfortunately, because of the time difference, by the time I was ready to watch it, it was too late. I already knew all the things that were yeah. going on. Well, that's yeah, that's interesting, the, the time difference part of this, because each of the past three Olympics have taken place in Eastern Asia. So they've had the similar time zone difference between the host city and the US. Sarah Fisher of Axios is pointing out, Susie, what you were just saying, that major moments are often broke on social media before they're aired on NBC in prime time. Just one point about the audience to respond, Susie, to what you're saying. Yes, I think audiences are generally dropping for a lot of these tentpole TV shows, but not to the same extent that this dropped. And also, if you look at something like the Super Bowl, actually that audience increased this year. So I think there's a general trend, but I think also when you look at the percentage decline with the Winter Olympics in particular, it was pretty stark. So final point, I was curious to know if any, any if they can do anything to, to kind of 
spruce up the games at all. Uh, one of the things noted, Ina Frieda Axio saying NBC's VR Olympics app, which was running on MetaQuest, uh, saying that virtual reality has the potential to bring people closer to the action and deeper behind the scenes, but at the same time, it can be more isolating, tiring, and blurry than watching a broadcast on a nice TV saying that it was cool to kind of sit, you know, courtside, ice side, uh, ringside, whatever you call a, an ice rink, uh, and see what it was like to be that close to the action. But after a few minutes, five, ten minutes, maybe, um, you, you kind of were over the experience. So I don't even know if there's anything they can do in terms of how the thing is broadcast to really change things up. Anyway, that's what we've got time for for the story of the week. It's time now for the game of the week. But first, quick word from our sponsor, Mountain. Annual connected TV ad spending is expected to increase over 54% to $29.5 billion by 2024. So why all the interest in connected TV? Because it's television advertising that's fully targetable and measurable, and that's a major opportunity for marketers. Mountain Performance TV makes the most of that opportunity and offers an easy way to buy, manage, and measure connected TV campaigns. Visit mountain.com to learn more. Right, folks, we are back. It's time now for the game of the week. Today's game, what is the point? Where I read out four stories and Susie, Dave and Paul will tell us what they think is the main takeaway of the story. Okay, answers get one point. Good answers will get you two. And answers that leave you with the same feeling as when you realize you've bought the perfectly ripe watermelon because the first bite is too good. Answers that leave you with that feeling get you three points. Each person gets 20 seconds to answer before they hear this. Whoever has the most points wins, gets the last word. That's how games work. We start with Paul. Video length. Some platforms are making their videos longer, like TikTok. Others are cutting them down, like Netflix. Let's start with TikTok. The once short form video app is expanding its max video length to 10 minutes. They introduced three minute videos just last July. And at the same time, long form content giant Netflix is bringing its Fast Laughs channel that displays a TikTok-like feed of 30-second clips from content on the platform to its TV app, notes insider intelligence analyst Daniel Konstantinovich. Paul, video length, what's the point? Well, this seems to be what happens with almost every platform. That They find that the grass is always greener, so you have Netflix, which is known for one-hour dramas and two-hour movies, now doing 30-second comedy clips, and you have TikTok, which is known for very short viral videos, going to a much longer length. The social platforms that have tried this in the past really have not gotten very far with it as far as transitioning their kind of DNA into something different and vice versa. So it's an interesting experiment. I think it'll definitely get some share of audience, but ultimately not really going to move the needle too much for either of these platforms. Dave. Yeah, it sort of feels like a Freaky Friday moment where uh, folks are swapping uh, their traditional <laughs> to uh, someone else's traditional It'll all come out in the wash. I don't think it's going to be someone's exclusively short form, long form. You know, we are seeing the TikTokification, uh, which is harder to say than quibification, but it might last longer. <laughs> um, but it sort of, you know, feels like almost a try before you buy feature in some cases. But what it does allow is the algorithms to learn and presumably make uh, recommendations that would get better to the individual they're recommending to. Susie. I love this idea of the fast laughs from Netflix. I don't think about it as short form video. I think about it as an easier way to trial the show because you can click from the clip to go and see whatever the show that caught your attention. And it's like taking from shopping, right? It's user generated from the staff. It's not an algorithm, which everybody is not excited about anymore. And so I think it's a really clever idea. On the other hand, the 10 minute TikToks, I can't even watch 30 seconds. I don't, can't imagine 10 minutes. <laughs> To that point, TikTok was saying they're going to need to work out exactly how to position and present these videos on its platform since longer form content doesn't sit well in a vertical feed with shorter stuff people skim through. James Vincent at The Verge noting longer videos lets TikTok better compete with YouTube, capture an older audience potentially and increase overall engagement time. However, a switch to longer content may hurt the firm, may hurt TikTok by limiting the amount of data it can collect on users' watching habits which is what helps TikTok customize the algorithms it uses to attract users in the first place. Uh, basically, if you click on six videos per hour because they're longer versus you know, 100 per hour, you're going to have less data. We move to story two. We start with Dave. 
the decline of the impulse buy. Seven out of 10 US consumers are less likely to make impulse purchases now than before the pandemic, according to programmatic advertising company Bliss. No, it's Marianne Williamson of Chain Store Age. Research from KeyBank shows the share of Americans who made an impulse purchase from 2019 to 2020 fell from 47% to 42%. So that research supports the research from Bliss. Dave, the decline of the impulse buy, what's the point? Yeah, forgive the pun, but I don't buy it. Well played. Our um, need for or desire for instant gratification is still there. AI and recommendation engines are getting even more advanced. Frankly, in the reported surveys, nobody wants to admit to being influenced, but academic research suggests that spending habits um, have changed and we're doing more impulsive buying than before the pandemic. So I I don't buy this. Mm. Susie? Um, I don't agree with you, but I also didn't hear points for the first round, so I'm a little bit I'm a little bit saddened by that, and I don't know if there's an authority that's keeping track, but for the impulse purchase, I actually believe it because (laughs) impulse purchases by definition are like fun, delightful, not high price points, but they're still like self-gifting. And now, especially right now with inflation and all these other headlines, and people are just worried about their purse strings. And so I think they're just not spending as much frivolous money today. Susie, just to mention, (laughs) we've already agreed that this show doesn't come with points. Because you guys didn't want points, but you were ahead but you introduced after round them. one until you made that comment. You've now relegated yourself to third place. <laughs> Paul, what you got for us? I have to wonder if this data factors in the, I mean, if it's only about in-store or just impulse purchasing overall. But I would have to think that the big change in how we shop and, and you know, the increased shopping at home and not going into stores plays into the data if it's overall retail data that includes e-commerce. You know, in general, I, I tend to agree that we, it's almost human nature to do impulse buying and that most of those buys are not big ticket items that are going to be heavily affected by inflation. On the other hand, it really all comes down to whether we're talking about, you know, in-store or overall. Round three, is anyone actually winning the streaming wars? Disney, Netflix, Apple. Is anyone winning the streaming wars, asks The Economist. With 130 million worldwide subscribers, Disney Plus has established itself as a major video streaming player in two short years somehow. But The Economist notes that doubts are surfacing across the industry about how much of a prize awaits the victors of the streaming wars. The article notes that as revenue growth slows, costs Swell. Media firms will spend over $230 billion on video content this year. In one example, three years ago, Disney said it would spend about $2 billion on streaming content in 2024. They recently revised that $2 billion up to $9 billion. So, Susie, is anyone actually winning the streaming wars? What's the point? What I found interesting from this article was that the costs are increasing for the production. But of course, when they have so many people on their platform already, there's only so many more people they can get, right? So the costs are increasing, their revenue streams are not increasing. And then some of the original ways that they were getting money, like cable TV and or box office movie hits, aren't even making it into their P&L. And so I, I, nobody's winning. Nobody's going to win. Paul, I think what a lot of um, coverage misses, and Susie, you alluded to it, is the box office part of this and how if you just talk about the comparison between running a streaming service and the cable TV business, it's going to be hard to make those same margins for TV networks. But because all of the major streaming services are affiliated with theatrical movie companies and people basically aren't going to the movies anymore, the ability to monetize some of that content spending in the form of basically digital movie tickets, I think is one of the ways that they, they may actually be able to, you know, to make money with streaming services. So I, I don't think it's that nobody's going to make money, but I think that there's a lot more competition. And I think that the theatrical part of it is still developing. Dave. I'll build off of that, and I think there's other ways that uh, some people are monetizing, right? So you look at Disney, you get a huge show on Disney, they're not just monetizing it on their video platform, there's other ways for them to monetize. Obviously, Prime Video, which wasn't even in the list that you sent around, you know, to some extent, it's probably one of the, the most established, but it's not why anyone subscribes to Prime. And on the other hand, then Netflix obviously is the most dominant and probably has the 
the least churn. It feels like years ago, we used to say Google Analytics. You know, most companies had Google Analytics Plus. Netflix is like that. I think most people have Netflix Plus. I think long term, it'll be there. But as you and Paul have discussed on recent episodes, it's not necessarily growing at the same rate, but they seem to be the current winner. Round four, our final rounds. We start with Paul. Delivery culture. Delivery culture is here to stay, writes Damien Rollison of streetfightmag.com. He notes that food delivery services are continuing to achieve record growth even as consumers move closer to pre-pandemic levels of activity. Mr. Rollison points to a recent milestone of sorts when Uber said that they made more money in 2021 from delivery than they did from ride-sharing. Uber Eats is available in multiple countries with $8 billion in annual revenue, up over 400% on 2019. That said, according to Yelp's most recent economic average report, consumer interest in food delivery on the platform increased only 7% from 2020 to 2021. So, Paul, delivery culture, what's the point? Well, I think one of the points is that it's not a zero-sum game. So you can be going out to restaurants more as you emerge from the pandemic, but you could also continue to use delivery services more than you did before, partly because you've gotten used to that behavior and you, you know, you like the services and so forth. And then I think the other takeaway is that people really just don't like to pay extra fees. So to the extent that they have to, you know, pay a premium to use a specific delivery service, I think those are going to be, that's a harder sell than basically just placing an order and, you know, paying the tip, but not having that extra fee passed on to you as the consumer. Dave. You know, when you think back to when Steve Jobs left Google's board, not everyone understood why, and it was kind of respective strategic directions of the companies and the anticipated sort of crossing of the strategic vectors. And I think we're in the same moment right now where you look at Instacart, DoorDash, you just mentioned Uber, all these companies are starting to come together. We're going to continue to get things delivered. We'll get them from Amazon, we'll get them from Uber, we'll get them from a variety of places, but I don't think we'll have separate delivery mechanisms for cooked food, food prep, grocery, you'll have your preferred platform of choice and that's where you'll get all your deliveries from. And as Paul said, you'll also go out to eat and go out to shop. Susie. So I think consumers are looking for the easiest, most convenient, fastest, frictionless way. And these platforms understood that whether it was rideshare or delivering restaurant food wasn't enough. And like Dave was saying, they're going to have to increase the scope of what they carry. I don't know if it's going to be about the individual platform because each of the platforms are securing deals with different companies. And so it's going to be more about the retailer or the restaurant that you're interested in. Then you're going to go to that platform. And I think just fulfillment in general, there's always change happening right now. We're all talking about the go pups of the world, right? The quick commerce, 10 to 15 minutes and them too. They're doing convenience store stuff. They're doing their own private label. I think it's really just about what you need, getting it as soon as possible. And you'll go to whoever you need to go to. I think Susie, to that point, it's going to be really interesting to watch what happens, which is the tail and which is the, the dog, right? Who's wagging whom? Mm-hmm. Will we go to, to Target because I have an Instacart relationship or will I go Instacart because I have a Target relationship and then stay with Instacart delivery, for example? Consumers are brand loyal. So I think it'll be the, you'll pick the place that you're interested in buying the items from. And then that retailer's responsibility will be to figure out how to get to you the way you want to get it. Consumers, yeah, it's great, great points, folks. Consumers are brand loyal. But talking about brand loyalty, there's some good research from Coupon Follow showing a couple of things. One, almost six out of 10 folks said the COVID-19 pandemic has increased their frequency of food delivery orders. Uh, Number two, people reported using about two and a half food delivery apps on average. And number three, while DoorDash was the most popular food delivery app used by 45% of folks in the survey, 55%, over half of them, half of those users would switch to a different app if fees increased. So they're ready to run out the door as soon as the price goes up a little bit. So not the most loyal customers there. That's all we've got time for for the game of the week. This week's winner is Dave. It wasn't really close. It was pretty close. But Susie, after you started to criticize the game scoring, you were scratched. And Paul, your escalator pun that derailed the start of the show. Yeah, that lost you the game as well. Um, but also, Dave made some good points. But the, the quibification is just a good, it's a good term. So... After that, I stopped, uh, I stopped keeping track of the score. Congratulations to Dave. He wins again on a bit of a streak recently, Dave. You get the championship belt and also the, uh, the final word. 
Uh, so I bored everyone with my son's Eagle Scout project on two of these, although he did have some people who participated based on hearing it on this podcast. Amazing. Uh, so thank you to everyone that participated. And all I'm going to do is just uh, send out good thoughts to all of the people suffering in the world right now, uh, Ukraine being top of mind, but there's plenty of other places where people are suffering. So just good thoughts going out to people who are suffering. A great final word. That's all we've got time for for the game of the week. It's time now for Uncommon Knowledge. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge, the segment where we offer up some unpopular or atypical opinions about things. We start with an unpopular opinion from the BBC Radio 1 feature that this segment was inspired by, then an unpopular opinion from the internet, and finally, we get an unpopular opinion from one of our analysts related to the media world. We start with an unpopular opinion from the Radio 1 show. Uh, Robes, also known as dressing gowns in other parts of the world, (laughs) are useless outside of a hotel or a spa. How do we feel? I used to think so. Used to? What changed? Well, this is not a video podcast, but so for those <laughs> of you who, robe for people who can't. I'm not in my robe, but for those of you who can't see me, I save a lot of money on not going to barber shops because I get to trim my own hair because there's so little of it. And when I do so, a robe is a good garment to wear. Oh, okay. The home hairdressing situation. Just saying. Very nice. yep. But don't you okay. think it'll stick to the robe, like the cotton robe? Or do you have satin robes? My, my butler, uh, butler does all that stuff for me. Robe. So yeah, yeah, he brings me a satin robe each time, and I think he throws it out each time. So oh, wow. yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> I'm gonna say, Marcus, that I disagree with the statement partly because why do you need it in a hotel? I never understand why it's in a hotel. No idea. That's the only time, only place I've seen people. It's probably in the commercials. A spa uh, makes or maybe sense if you're walking around, right? But yeah. Yep, never understood it in a hotel either. That's the only place I can possibly imagine people using them. I guess because of movies. Boxers I, I, tend to wear them before they come out. I'm or, trying to think, when do you see, boxer, when do you yeah. see robes, right? Those tend to be Susie Satin. Tony yeah. Soprano wore it pretty well, but you know, he's, he's long gone. I, mean, I have robes actually hanging on the back of my bathroom door, but I don't think I've ever used them. I'm not even there sure what I would do with them. Nope, throw it out. Throw yeah. it away. Uh, all right, let's go uh, one from the internet. Uh, This is from the internet, okay, people? So before you just decide to stop listening to the podcast forever in protest, (laughs) this isn't from me. Game of Thrones is massively overrated. I Personally, I don't trust people who haven't seen it. Oh. That's just how I feel. This is why I never win. You haven't seen Game of Thrones? Ever. I could tell. I could tell. Oh, Oh, Dave. There goes this. That's a real shame. I knew about Susie, but that surprises me, Dave. (laughs) Paul, come on. I have not watched it, so oh, I Oh, for crying out loud. <laughs> this is Yahtzee all over again. How is it? <laughs> Victoria, come on. Come through for me. You've got to have seen Game of Thrones. You've got to have seen it. It traumatized my life. In a it was good, bad. Oh, it was bad. In, oh. <laughs> all of that for nothing? No. Uh, nothing. Okay. But maybe it was you guys who wrote this pop- unpopular opinion on the internet. I don't have an opinion. So I guess no one's going to be watching House of the Dragon. Unbelievable. Season one started out great. Season That's two, true. amazing. I had high hopes, and then it all got just shot to hell. So yes, I have seen it, but I have very mixed feelings about all right. it. To anyone listening, don't listen to them. They're out there. Having minds. mentioned The Sopranos, uh, Marcus, it might be the last time I watched a popular, uh, like mainstream popular show. The Sopranos? Oh, yeah. You mean you're not I'm watching to think The what Bachelor? I've watched since that everyone talked about. Didn't watch The Bachelor. Didn't watch Peaky Breaking Blinders. Bad. Did you watch? Tried it. Didn't love it. <laughs> no. Dave, if I could take the belt from you, I would consider it. That's all I'm saying. I'll, I'll, I'll saying. send you an NFT. <laughs> T- Dave, Ted Lasso? Uh, oh, that is a good one. Okay. There we go. He's back. The He's morning back. show. That one's pretty good. No, you've lost me again. Um, anyway. Um, all right. Let's take one from our analyst. Uh, this uh, week's unpopular opinion is brought to you by Susie. What you got for us? So in all the reading that we do, I came across this study It's a checkout benchmark study from a company called Bold. And their statistic is that 70% of shoppers are abandoning their cart along the way, which I don't know if I would say 7 out of 10 people, but I believe that cart abandonment is pretty high. But then they're saying that 48% of shoppers are also stopping once they're at the checkout. So they're leaving the checkout behind and not actually processing their item. So one in two people are not, they're going through the process of putting it in your car, going to get ready to pay, and then just not buying the item. And I just don't believe that it's that high. So really quickly, why 
Susie, as our retail expert, w- why would you think people are abandoning their car, particularly at the checkout? What, what would you think would be the, top, the, the number one reason for that? I think it's payment. I think the payment option that they want to use, whether it's like an easy click and go or whether it's a digital wallet that already has their information saved is missing. And so they're like, oh, this is too hard. I'm not going to bother retyping all my information. I'll just go to Amazon. And how do retailers overcome that? Do they let people know ahead of time, further along, uh, further um, in the in the purchasing journey, uh, that these are the payment options we have? Should they just provide as many payment yes. options as possible? Probably a good one. Yes, they should. Okay. It's shame on a retailer who doesn't have that figured out already. Yeah. Um, what do we think, folks? Do we agree with these uh, with these numbers? This high cart abandonment rate seems really high, but. I mean, I guess the question is, is it 7 out of 10 shoppers have ever abandoned? Then it seems believable as opposed to 7 out of 10 purchases. I think we've probably all abandoned at some point. Yeah, 7 mm-hmm. out of 10 have abandoned at some point in the shopping journey. They haven't made it to the checkout. But the checkout is 1 out of 2, which is 50% of people. Yeah. That's I think it lot. depends on the retailer there. You, you mentioned, obviously, payment. I think the other thing is shipping fees, You know, depending on the retailer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I Guilty is charged on that. You know, yeah, you see you're suddenly the shipping right. costs as much as the item I was buying. Not or buying like if you want the delivery of a certain window and window, it's not yep. there and then yeah. you're like, oh man. It didn't shock me, at least in the post-pandemic world, partly because, yeah, I think a lot of retailers are not transparent enough about shipping costs and about availability or sizes and colors and just so many things become clear to you when you get to that checkout. The other thing that I find happening more and more, this is probably partly due to supply chain issues, is that it's really hard to find the exact thing you're looking for. So I end up basically browsing on a lot of different sites. And sometimes I'll put things in the checkout just so that I don't forget and I can come back to it. But then I'm only going to buy from one of the two or three retailers that I'm I'm browsing on. So that's mm-hmm. obviously going to skew those numbers. So, I mean, technically that's cart abandonment. At some point, it's the checkout part. It's like that last little mile, that last little part of the journey where you're ready to spend your cash or credit card. So I, I kind of agree with you, Paul, though. But Susie, to your point, like I, there's been times where I've gotten to the pay the money bit. Yeah. I've seen the price overall and I thought to myself, ah, maybe I should quickly check that other site and I'll go and check uh, it. And maybe yeah. I won't yeah, buy on that same, other site, but maybe here. I just won't come back yeah. Yeah. in that moment. That's very yeah. possible. I mean, I do it too all the time. I drop all kinds of things into my cart and then you start getting the emails <laughs> from the right. retailer yeah. like, don't forget right. You left something uh, in your cart. So but that I believe. Yeah. yeah. Some of it is definitely cart abandonment, but some of it is what Marcus was saying, yeah, where you really do fair. get to that checkout and, and you, you know, you encounter an unpleasant surprise and yeah. you go somewhere else. I always go and put one thing into my cart to see what time slot can I get that works for me before I build my cart. So technically I'm part of that one and two. Because I'm mm, yeah. just about to pay. That's the only time you get to see your slot. And then I'm like, nope, didn't work for me. Uh, Sometimes I leave things there so long that they're not fresh anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well played, Paul. Well played. Uh, that's what we've got time for, for Uncommon Knowledge. It's time now for Dinner Party Data. This is the part of the show where we tell you about the most interesting thing that we've learned this week. We start with Dave, this week's winner of the Game of the Week. Dave, what you got for us? Okay, so uh, Women's History Month, March 4th, the day that the pod goes out, is actually the anniversary of when Jeanette Rankin entered Congress, first woman to enter Congress in the U.S. Uh, Today, 27% of Congress is women. Only 10% of S&P 500 CEOs are women. And as most of us probably know, women earn only 82% of what men earn. But in more positive news, quick thing I didn't know, the history of Women's History Month started as Women's Day in 1909, became Women's Week in 1981, and Women's Month in 1987, and is declared uh, Women's History Month by the president every year. Today, as we look forward, great news, more women earning degrees than men, 59% of women going on to get advanced degrees versus 50% of men. And worth calling out, given everything that's going on in the world, the 2022 theme is women providing healing and promoting hope. So I think that's something we could all get behind. 
Very nice. If it went from a day to a week to a month, when do we get to every day being Women's History Day and it's 365 days a year? Yeah. Probably what? when those yeah. numbers get to 50% of Congress, 50% of CEOs, yeah. <laughs> 50% of Supreme Court, etc. And didn't the, uh, these are good numbers, Dave, very, very fascinating. And didn't the women, the US women's uh, soccer team, they just got... Yeah. Um, Correct. Huge a, win, yeah. yeah. A huge yeah, win did. for more yeah. equal pay, um, which is only fair. Actually, they should be getting more considering the American team wins nothing. The American men's team wins nothing. And the female soccer team in the US are really your only hope, America. <laughs> That's just the truth of it. Okay? Think about it. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, Susie, what do you got for us? So I didn't realize my theme was a little bit more Olympics, Canada, UK based, but it's also women's based. Um, did you all know that hockey started in the UK eons and eons ago, and it was with a stick and a ball in the 18th and 19th century? But it is truly the Canadians in 1875 in Montreal, Quebec, that invented hockey as we know today. And this year, the Canadian women's team won the hockey game. They only started doing, which is kind of sad. I was really surprised about this. They only started playing hockey for the women's team in 1998. It was acceptable wow. to have a women's hockey team, right? Um, and so they've whoa. only had seven games, of which Canada has won five and the U.S. has won wow. too. And this goes back to the original. Like, I would have wanted to watch both. I didn't realize that the Canadian men's team didn't win, but they have won the most gold medals in the hockey games. But I didn't realize when the games were because nobody from NBC pinged me to tell me. <laughs> Don't they know who you are? Yeah, obviously. <laughs> Every app is personalized. They should know exactly what I want to watch and when I want to watch it and remind me to watch it. So I didn't get to watch. So I was very sad when I did the research for this that the Canadian men team didn't win. But the women won. And that was very exciting. So I think in the in the spirit of threes a trend, um, I think we need to keep track now of things that the British invented only to have someone else do them better. So now oh, we like have cricket. soccer. Yeah, we, yeah. Have, we have soccer. We have hockey. And, and of course, cricket. we have cricket. Okay, so four. And yeah. we have the United States of America. Take it away, Marcus. Better. Oh, my goodness. Negative a thousand for Paul. I will Banished never win again. From the show. <laughs> Not that I was going to anyway, but that seals it. Two months well, suspension. Paul, you know what? It's funny you say that because the men's UK team has who invented hockey, has only won one gold medal in all of the time that hockey has okay. been part of the Olympics. Like I said. You're welcome for all the inventions. <laughs> but Susie, are you blending field and ice hockey there? Just no, no, it's just so. regular hockey. But, but you're right that there was a whole history around hockey and field hockey, and it's called different things in different places, and there's ice and whatever, blah, blah, blah. I but wouldn't I'm, expect anyone in the British Isles to have won ice anything. Yes, but they invent. It's from what they started that they invented modern day hockey in Canada. Yeah, people had to change the rules in order to compete. I think, right, Marcus? <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Well, says the Irish guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, you're right. I was wondering yeah. why you were standing up for the UK. Yeah, Dave's got me. We had indigenous sports. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Paul, what do you got for us? I have the top streaming shows of 2021 per Nielsen. And um, mm, how high is Squid Game? Well, Squid Game is very high up there and um, is actually number two. So the top oh, wow. five, the top five original streaming shows of 2021 were Lucifer, Squid Game, The Great British Baking Show, Virgin River, and Bridgerton. So the top takeaways. Other than the fact that I'd only heard of three of the top five <laughs> shows before I saw this list. Heard of two. Um, is that besides having all of the five top original shows, Netflix had nine of the top 10 and 12 out of the top 15. And wow. they did even better with acquired or licensed shows where they had all of the top 10 and 14 of the top 15. Movies were a different story. Disney was by far the, the leader there. They had eight of the top 10, including the top three, which were... Luca, Moana, and Raya and the Last Dragon. And again, one of the takeaways being that I look at this list and I have not heard of too many of the titles. So I guess I'm living under a rock. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> well, you know what I'm surprised about? Every time I use Netflix, I'm like, what am I going to watch today? There's nothing good to watch. And meanwhile, 30 they second have comedy so clips. many. 30 second comedy clips. I'm going to have to. Yeah. <laughs> right. Problem solved. Very nice. Um, so Paul, what were you watching last year? If none, you were, none of these fit into your... 
I have to say, I was watching the Great British Baking Show. Well played. Uh, what yeah. else did I watch last year? I don't know. It was too long ago. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> it's like last week. Yeah. Uh, all right. I've got one for you. Before the pandemic, three quarters of Americans took an escalator daily. But who invented the escalator? In 1859, Nathan Ames from Michigan invented something called revolving stairs. However, Ames was unable to put the invention into practical use. Uh, He died a year later in 1860. The earliest working type of escalator was patented in 1892. So that's what, 30-odd years later, by Jesse W. Reno, introduced four years later in uh, 1896 as a novelty ride at Coney Island Theme Park in New York. Also, during that decade, George H. Wheeler patented a moving stairway person called Charles D. Seaberger bought Wheeler's patent in 1898 and went on to work at the Otis Elevator Company, developing the first step-type moving stairway. It was Seaberger who created the name Escalator from the word Scala, uh, which is Latin for steps, and the word Elevator, which was already in use, uh, general use in the US by this time. Reno, the person and Otis, the company, would emerge as, as the two driving forces behind Escalator development for the next decade or so until 1911 otis absorbed reno and became the sole manufacturer so the british did not invent the escalator (laughs) probably and then you made it better unbelievable (laughs) unbelievable uh a couple of escalator facts for you the central mid-levels escalator system in hong kong is the world's largest outdoor escalator although it has got a cover over it escalator system with a total length of 2600 feet which would be about 10 new york city blocks Uh, Escalator steps aren't the same height as stairs, as you may have gathered, um, as they're more difficult to walk up when the escalators aren't moving. They're typically eight and a half inches versus the standard seven and a half regular stairs. And escalators move at half of normal walking speed, which is why you get so bloody annoyed when you're at the airport and someone insists on standing on one of those and blocking everyone who's trying to get past. Well, here's something the British invented that I don't think anyone does better, Marcus. Everything? Every time I'm in London and I'm on an escalator, people are so good about staying on one side if they're not going to walk and then letting people who want to walk go on the, you know, the other lane. And I can't remember if it's right or left because you guys do everything backwards in that sense it's not anyway. backwards, it's the right way. <laughs> but the point is that if you want to, you know, walk instead of just stand on the escalator, you can in Britain, but you can't anywhere else that I've been. Politeness. Yes. No one does it better. Actually, Wait, I thought everybody better. knew that you're supposed to stand on the right and walk up on the left. I didn't even realize that was a cultural difference. Maybe no. maybe in Canada they do it also. Yeah, of course. Susie, I don't know. But, but Susie, I want to hear about the Macy's escalators because they're like the coolest. You know what? Actually, I have to be honest. I don't know enough about them. Unbelievable. <laughs> so, sorry. But I, the I first can just... were made of wood. So they are. Yes, yes. Kind of that's really the they're main point. They're definitely original. They are what I, I mean, I know little random facts. I know that the, they don't, nobody makes those parts anymore. So whenever the escalators need parts, they have to unfortunately take it away from one. So that's why you don't see as many escalators as there once was. And you see some of the more modern ones. Huh. Then, yeah. Because there's wow. no other way. That's probably, probably the only thing I know. Okay. Just the one thing. Yeah. And that's just in the New York flagship store? <laughs> yes. Actually, I don't Very even nice. know if that's true. Oh, for crying out loud. <laughs> I mean, I was just there for 10 plus years, you know, like. Disregard most of what Susie's just said. <laughs> anyway, that's what we've got time for for today's episode. Thank you so much to my guests. Thank you to Susie. Thanks for having me. Not for the last bit. Thank you to Paul. <laughs> hey, thank you. Thank you to Dave, this week's winner of the Game of the Week. Thanks, Marcus. Thank you to Victoria, not for her comments on the Game of Thrones. She edits the show, and thank you so much to everyone listening. To ask us questions, just say hi. You can email us at podcast at emarketer.com. We'll hopefully see you on Monday for the Behind the Numbers Daily, the eMarketer podcast made possible by Mountain. Happy weekends. Unless you don't watch Game of Thrones, and then if you have an average weekend, that's on you. Okay? <laughs> You've only yourself to blame. <laughs>